Hi everyone, it's Judy. Welcome back to the On Track Podcast. Today I have a treat for you. We're gonna talk to two young, bright leaders at Advanced Assembly. Chow Vang, who is the engineering manager there, and also Sebastian Weber, who is their process engineer. Both these young, bright people have come up through Advanced Assembly, learned in the trenches, and they're gonna share great tips with you on how to make sure that your assembly is done right the first time and save you a lot of headaches. So lean and enjoy, I'll see you on the other side. Welcome to All Team's On Track Podcast, where we talk to leaders about PCB design, tackling subjects ranging from schematic capture all the way to the manufacturing floor. I'm your host, Judy Warner. Please listen in every week and subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, and all your favorite podcast apps. And be sure to check out the show notes at altium.com forward slash podcast, where you can find great resources and multiple ways to connect with us on social media. Well, Sebastian and Chow, thank you so much for joining me from Advanced Assembly today. Um, we're, we're delighted to have you and, and learn a lot, I think, from where you two come from about assembly and things that designers and engineers can do to get their boards faster, cheaper, and more reliably. Man, did I sound like a commercial just now or what? <laughs> That's why I think we wanted that. <laughs> I know, right? Did, I'll pay you later. Anyhow, would you both take a moment? Um, Chow, why don't we start with you and just introduce yourself. Tell us what you do at Advanced Assembly. Uh, my name is Chow, and I am the engineering manager here. Uh, my degree and background is in computer engineering and electronics technology. I have been with Advanced Assembly for 10 years now. I actually started off as the coding engineer using our proprietary software to create pre-production files for our production floor. Um, I went into sales for two years, and then I came back into engineering. I have been in my current role for three years now. You brave girl going out into sales. Good for you. <laughs> oh, Bet yeah. you have a, a little, some scars from that deal. I've been there. I, I did. It's much better <laughs> in the engineering world. Yeah, yeah. So, I, yeah. yeah, I think so. Okay, Sebastian, how about you, buddy? All right, so my name is Sebastian Weber. I'm a process engineer. My degree and background is in electronics engineering and quick turn assembly. Um, I started off in this company as a receiving and shipping supervisor, and just with my technical knowledge, I got asked a bunch of questions and slowly but surely got pushed over to a more technical position. Um, eventually got to the point where quality was coming to me asking about root cause stuff, and they just decided to make me a process engineer. So <laughs> that's, um, that's pretty best much- Best way to learn in the trenches. Oh yeah, it definitely is. Yeah. Um, and I've been doing that for about three and a half years now or so, so. Okay, who wants to tell us about um, Advanced Assembly and a little bit about the history of your company, where you're located, and your size, and so forth? So I think I could talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, Advanced Assembly was, and still is, the original kind of quick turn PCB assembly service shop. Um, we were kind of the first ones that really pioneered into that sort of uh, services. There wasn't a whole lot of people that really focused on that kind of thing uh, when Advanced Assembly first started, which was 15 years ago. Okay. Um, they were built from the ground up. We were specifically geared towards those uh, kind of prototype-y kind of builds, quick turn, uh, very small quantities. And over the years, we've assembled over 40,000 unique designs, which is more than pretty much any other assembler in the entire industry. Wow. And we're always looking for more. That's um, crazy. Yes. We currently have uh, approximately 105 people, I believe, we have. Um, uh -huh. And our focus is on... Our focus to everyone is that we are real people with real experiences, making sure that each and every project is uh, is assembled exactly how and when our customer needs it. That's that's a if you deliver on that, you will have no shortage of business, I'm sure. Um, no, it's worse. You said they've been in business now 15 years. Where are you located? Uh, Aurora, Colorado. Aurora. 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 I'm like yeah. Aurora. What yeah. what what yeah. major city in Colorado is that near? So it's pretty close to Denver. Okay. We're, we're right by the airport, the Denver uh, DIA. Oh, okay. Very good. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you both for that. So um, we had a really interesting conversation getting ready for this podcast. So uh, this is I think this is going to be a really fun one. So 
I learned a lot from you guys just talking on the phone. So, Cha, I want to start with you. And um, so, obviously, our audience here are engineers and PCB designers, right, that are developing yeah. hardware and say they need to get something um, assembled. They shoot you, you know, a data package and some files. Yep. Then what happens? So the files that we actually need to start the DFA check, the design for assembly check, uh -huh. um, critical are your bill materials, XYS, which is your pick and place files, and then all the layers of your Gerbers, which must include copper, paste, and silk screen. And I know that not every customer has the opportunity or has most of those files. So if you're missing the XYRS file or the paste, we also uh, have services here to create those files for customers who don't have those files. Okay. For us. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Yeah. How common is that? I, I don't really know a lot about assembly files other than the assembly file and the bomb. So for example, for us, we process anywhere between um, 25 to 30 jobs that actually get booked into the system. Mm -hmm. And of those jobs, I'd say almost all of them go on hold for some sort of missing files initially because customers just don't think that we need them, okay. but we actually do. Okay. And so um, it happens a lot more often than you would think. Interesting. So while uh, Chow and her team are scrambling around to get the files and do the front end engineering, um, Sebastian, what's sort of your first touch to a job and, and what's happening on your side? So uh, definitely the first thing we do is kind of the same thing she's doing. She's reviewing kind of her side of the files just to see what can be coded and whatnot. Um, the first thing that my team specifically looks for is we look for special assembly notes, um, designs that aren't necessarily the best for production or manufacturing. And we'll try and identify those up front and try and get that information back to the customer as quickly and most efficiently as possible. The reason why we do this is because we want to try and uh, identify any sort of assembly issues beforehand mm -hmm. and get the answers long before we're actually building. Because the last thing you want is to have a job due, you know, two days uh, from then and then all of, you know, everything that's going wrong with the job should just pop up everywhere. Right. So we try to identify those beforehand using that. So Sebastian, what are some of the showstoppers that you most routinely see? Uh, via and pad, especially on like BGAs, um, those are usually issues. If we see uh, micro BGAs, like glass topped micro BGAs, um, we'll start looking at what uh, steps need to be taken on production mm -hmm. just to make sure we can mitigate any issues on the floor. Um, overage issues, if we know that there's really, really small parts like uh, 0201s, 10005s, we'll make sure that we're getting the right amount of overage um, just to make sure that we're not shooting ourselves in the foot later on during assembly. Yeah. So what what um, the VN pads, what in assembly, what comes up for you in, in that area? Um, so typically if you have via in pad, what will happen is uh, after you paste your boards and you place your parts and you reflow it, it actually gives a little cavity for that solder to go down into, mm. um, preventing a really good connection on the actual part. Um, and when you have BGAs or bottom terminal components that have connections underneath the part, it's a lot harder to rework and a lot harder to fix. Yeah, that makes sense. What comes up for you most often, Chow? Um, for us, because we're looking at the files ahead of time, what we're seeing is we're taking the customer's files into our proprietary software. Um, the things that we're actually looking for and finding are um, in the customer's bill of materials, they're calling out one particular part and then in their description, they're calling out another different part. So we're actually comparing those two. Mm. For example, resistors and capacitors, customers may put a one microfarad part on there. And then in their description, they're calling out a 10 microfarad part. So at that point, we're writing a hold for the customer saying, you're telling me two different parts for this line, which one do you actually want to place on your board? Mm -hmm. Or if they're calling out, because components have the same type of functionality, but different packages. And okay. so a customer may call out a um, 
eight league goal wing type part and it comes in a narrow and wide version so their part may be a narrow version but they design the footprint for the wide version mm. so we're putting package models on the customer's footprint and if it doesn't fit that's going to be another flag for the customer we're also looking for polarities um, issues so if the customer's not putting their pin ones their plus and on the capacitors or um, cathodes on their diodes, then we're not, we don't know how to orient those parts. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna put those as polarity questions to the customer as well. And, and we're gonna get their feedback on how to proceed. Okay. Not for the faint of heart, I always say. <laughs> so yeah. it's a lot. <laughs> and then you're trying to do it fast. We um, are trying to do it fast, yes. Like super fast. I don't know that, you know, assembly is not something not well suited for speed because of the complexity of just a single yeah. bomb, right? So how many yeah. parts are, say, on your average board? Uh, the that designs that we see, yes. The design that we actually see, we're looking anywhere from 250 to 500 parts. And then it would take us here to perform the de design for assembly check about an hour to two hours, depending on the complexity and how many actually different line items there are on that particular build. Right. And that's just like the median range, right? I mean, it can... That is, the, we have jobs that have thousands of parts and yeah. then someone has to look through all of that stuff and make sure everything fits perfectly. There's no layout issue. There's no polarity issue. There's mm -hmm. no questions mm -hmm. before we really fit to the floor. So, um, Sebastian, you know, Speaking to the audience that we have here, do you have a, a couple quick maybe takeaways that people like, what are things that they could do to help their job run smoother and know that when it comes out of the other end that it was it was <laughs> per their design intent? So one thing for sure that you always want to do, especially uh, if you're new to um, the industry, is you always want to make sure you talk to your assembly house and ask them specifically what kind of stuff that they need from you. Um, no one's going to know better than the assembly house themselves. Um, and especially, uh, like, obviously, Chow was talking about ha having the bomb, having the XYRS, having all of that. Um, but in addition, having a schematic can greatly help. And then even, uh, like, a drawing, a 3DF drawing or a 3D print, um, those can also help reduce mm -hmm. the amount of placement or polarity questions that happen on the spot. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, if uh, you do have a drawing, it's also really good to list off what kind of requirements or special needs... Um, that may be required for that particular build on the drawing itself just to make sure that the assembly house can fully capture and get you what you want. Um, and like I said, it's always good to just go back and ask questions and just really push and find, figure out what your uh, assembly house really needs from you. Yeah, good good call. Same question for you, Chow. What are what are some takeaways that you might say? Are there? Do you have different ones than, than Sebastian mentioned? Yeah, so when I was coming up with this list here, what I'd like customers to do is when you're looking for an assembly house, find someone that's going to be a partner for you, who's going to be able to check your design files before you order parts and boards. Uh, so that's a really important uh, service to give to clients, especially if it's a new design. And like I was saying, um, also make sure like Sebastian was saying, uh, make sure that in your assembly drawings you're calling out for special requirements because we are the ones writing the instructions for the different stations out on the production floor. So if you're requiring additional rework such as cutting trays, applying RTV, epoxy, Loctite, or if you have a bunch of hardware assembly, put all of that in your assembly drawing. We will convey it and write it in a way where the people who are installing these understand and it's easy for them to just go from step one to step 10 and do it flawlessly without any issues. Mm -hmm. um, and then really just for us, we give customers feedback in the beginning and also during um, the time that your boards are actually out on the production floor. So you may decide to pass on on our suggestion at that time, but keep that information so that when you do do your next revision, make those implementations because um, that's going to save you a lot of time, revision, and rework costs that you don't yeah. want to be spending. Right. That's a great idea. Yeah. Because usually, oh, yeah, yeah, because, yeah, <laughs> yeah it, because a lot of times boards have to go through, you know, another revision or two somewhere down the road. And if you could implement yeah. those, you know, you can't do anything about it now. But if you could implement it in the future, that would be a great, great help. Yeah. 
So, um, so how many jobs do you guys handle, say, a day per day, approximately? Well, for us and my team, we do 25 to 30 per day, and that's jobs that are going through this design for assembly check. Mm -hmm. That's how much we release through our actual team. But for Sebastian, I'll let him answer as far as how many they actually produce all out on the production floor. So we process on average about 20 jobs every day. And once again, these are all just different unique designs. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of that is actually fed into how we have grown as a company because we've had to deal with, you know, on average 20 different designs every day. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of seen the gambit and we've seen all kinds of issues and all kinds of stuff. So there's a lot of good resources there. So I'm kind of in a corny way teeing you up here to say, so if our listeners implemented some of those things you suggest, suggested, right? Um, fixing some of those things, saving on, you know, yield or respin or whatever. How, how do you, how would that impact, impact your day to day and the, you know, what's happening for the customer? So for me, um, in our business, we do a lot of quick turns. So when you're having these jobs put on hold, I'm emailing you, I'm following up with phone calls, I'm waiting for you to respond back. And our your turn time actually doesn't start until I release this job and these build files to the production floor. So if there are no issues, it'll get automatically released to the floor. That's what we call an auto approval. But if you're not implementing these changes and you have a bunch of issues, it's gonna go on hold. And if you are needing one day, two day, three day, five days, it's gonna impact that lead time. And so it's really crucial for the customers to take our advice, implement the changes, so that way your job doesn't get on hold and it can start immediately as soon as we receive your parts and boards. Makes sense. How about, how about you, Sebastian? Anything to add? Oh, yeah. So I got lots. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, uh, I always say better planning means better results. And it's kind of that exact same thing is if we can identify those issues up front over in the engineering section, take their advice, update those different little those little changes and everything. And it's going to make that job run that much smoother. The last thing you want is a mid process stop, you know, two days before like the jobs do. Um, and find out that there is a huge uh, assembly issue that cannot be fixed. That can lead to thousands and thousands of dollars in rework, and we definitely don't want that for our customers. Yeah. We want them to, to build a relationship with us where it's beneficial for both parties. Yes. And by the way, correct me if I'm wrong, but <clears throat> once it's that far down the, the pike, right, mm -hmm. if you had to start pulling parts, some of those parts just get destroyed. Right. Yes. You, you can't. Yep. They're not salvageable. No. And that comes out of the customer's pocket usually. Right. Because, you know, if you even can rework it, maybe you have to run the boards. Maybe the boards are too destroyed. Maybe they have to be redone completely. And you're paying for parts that you never use, which to yes. me, like parts add up. They're so expensive. And I've been involved in when jobs like that are going in the trash can and it's like, ugh, you know, oh, yeah. painful, super painful. And then my friend, um, John Watson, who's a design manager, and he says, and then you have to take the walk of shame down the hall to your manager's <laughs> office <laughs> right? to That's tell true. him, oh, boss, I forgot to, blah, blah, blah. Um, Something really interesting about you guys, I thought that this was stunning to me when we were talking the other day, is, uh, Chow, I think you mentioned that all this front-end engineering you do before you get a purchase order. That is true. So we don't always win all of our quotes, but we do perform the DFA checks on these quotes so that by the time you're getting these quotes back from the salesperson, you also have a list of these engineering issues. So before parts and boards are ordered, it gives you the opportunity to make changes to your Gerbers, buy new parts, suggest new parts, and that way it saves you time and revision. And um, we do it for free for the customer. Because, so. I don't know, again, I've been out of it for a while, but at least in the, you know, olden days, they wouldn't do that for free. They wouldn't do all the DFA before there was a PO 
placed, right? They'd be yeah. like, give me the minimum viable information I need to give you a quote. Yeah. Um, and then once you got the PO, you would start doing all the DFA stuff. So, and you, and you lose some of these, right? So it's like time lost. That is true. I, I want to tell you that we win 100% of our quotes, but we don't. Um, and so, but we just do it because we want to help engineers out. And I'm just hoping that if something doesn't work out with their current assembler, that they would just think of us and how much we've helped them and just give us an opportunity, a shot to build one of their jobs in the future. Well, you win my little, you know, Saint Chow because, <laughs> and good for advanced assembly because I don't know a lot of assembly shops that would do that because it's labor and it's time and yeah. it's money. So most wouldn't do that. So that's phenomenal. Um, and you said what, it takes at least a couple hours on each job to for your team to do their job, right? Ciao. It does. It does. So we actually do about 40 to 60 quotes a day. And so when you're thinking about like an hour to two hours each, that is a lot of manpower. But we're hoping like the customer is just wowed by the services that they're receiving, that they just, you know, think of us when they're ordering or when they're, you know, thinking about choosing the assembly house. And that's what that's why we do it. That's wild. Um, but it's obviously working. You guys have been around for a long time. So um, I, I want to um, change lanes really quick because there's something I forgot to ask you earlier is mm -hmm. you mentioned that early on in your career, Chow, you were involved in, in coding um, yes. proprietary software that's run inside of Advanced Assembly. Why proprietary? Yeah. Isn't there like commercial off-the-shelf assembly software that you buy or why why proprietary so I've actually had the opportunity to look into other softwares and things like that what's out on the market right now mm -hmm. and to get it to do the same thing as our software currently it takes it would actually have me hire a completely new person added to my team just to do the same amount of work and so yeah. what we're so what I'm doing is in our software it's really easy to see the customers layouts it's really easy to see the customers entire bomb it's really easy all of our packages we make custom so if it's a new part and we don't have that package in our models we create one specifically for that part so it's more accurate to that part number okay. we overlay that on the customers um, designs and it can tell us whether or not that part fits or not and so it's just more custom to us and we find that it's so quick and easy just to be able to look at it and tell that it, there is a problem or not because most of these other software they just take so much time to actually get it to a point where you can do the actual review that's and for us we just drop all these files in and we can automatically see it that's amazing. Yeah. Um, now, once you do all that front end engineering, right? Mm -hmm. So I have a, a couple years under my belt of working for an EMS company, and I know one thing that the project managers would get the thing in, and what would take them the longest part is just to scrub the bomb and to check mm -hmm. on parts availability. Sebastian, how, how do you guys, is that happening at the same time? Is that How's so, so we'll actually, out? we'll actually source all of the parts beforehand. Uh, once again, so kind of with the whole custom proprietary software, um, a lot of times we feel like the off-the-shelf stuff is really generic and not tailored enough to what we need to do. Mm -hmm. Because we're trying to kick stuff out so quick, we have to modify a lot of what's already out there. Um, so we will actually source all of your parts uh, during the quoting phase just to make sure that everything is available. And we'll actually use that uh, using some proprietary software that utilizes Octopart API. Oh, Octopart. Yep. Good job. You know, I <laughs> just had Chris Calvi who runs Octopart. Obviously, they're owned by Altium. But um, they run really also very quite independently. And he was talking about this very thing that... They created APIs that could drop into anybody's system, and here you guys are, one of those companies. Yeah. I had no idea. So that's very fun. And, um, and yeah, because normally if you don't have something like Octopart, that process could take – it just takes so long. It's painful. So Oh, yes. Yeah. So, so painful. The, the Octopart API integration has actually been extremely smooth and, and almost flawless. Um, 
we use this to automate the process, and I think beforehand it used to take probably one hour or so if you wanted to really uh, source like a, a really decent bomb. Uh, now with all of this integration and everything else, we can do it in as little as one minute. What? Um, yeah, that's it's absolutely insane. Um, our average is about five to seven minutes, which is still pretty good bragging rights, but <laughs> so. Wow. But yeah, the Octopar team has really made a, uh, an extremely useful tool and a great example of where companies in the industry should really be heading towards. See, I didn't, I didn't pay you or send you money in the mail to say that, right? <laughs> like, yeah, no, I really did not. I, it's, <laughs> it just so happens. In fact, I'll um, share that in the show notes, the one I just did with Chris Calvi, because, you know, he could talk all day about how awesome he thinks Octopart is, but to hear it from somebody who's using it and benefiting you know, getting back that much time is amazing. So thanks for sharing that. Um, Chow, you mentioned early on, like what percentage of jobs that come in have issues? 95% of them. They have some sort of issues or just concerns that we have for the customer to address just in case they're ramping up to go into those production runs because it'll be okay for these one or two, five, ten pieces. Um, someone in the back can easily fix those, rework those, but when you're doing those hundreds and thousands of pieces, you definitely don't want those issues because though your assembly house at that point will charge you thousands of dollars to fix those for you. Yeah. So you definitely want to get it right during the R&D prototype phase. Um, and that's what we do is we help customers through this phase into those production ready type quantities. Which I, again, there's, I learned so much just asking questions here on this podcast, but let's see if you agree or disagree. My friend Julie Ellis from TTM says there's no such thing as a quick and dirty prototype. <laughs> I agree. Agree, right. I agree too. Yeah, and I so agree. you're really thinking, even though you're like somewhat of a prototype focused shop, you're looking at will this be able to be produced exactly in volume, which is very forward thinking. Again, I feel like you guys are being really proactive on behalf of your customer, which is awesome. Yes. And like I said, even these prototype designs, we want to look through everything and give feedbacks to the customer because we want them, by the time they get these boards, to have the highest quality of work and to have functional boards. And so that's what we want the customer to be able to do. And we do that all up front. And if they did design something incorrectly, they have the opportunity to make these revision changes. So even their first R&D build, it's going to work. I have a funny story to tell you guys. <clears throat> so I did a I did a podcast with um, Bill Hurd, wh who was one of the original designers of Commodore Computer. Do you guys even know what Commodore Computer is? <laughs> okay, so Sebastian does this. <laughs> like you weren't born, Chow. Like it they were I remember my dad. It was like one of the very first PCs. So Commodore he designed sixty four. <laughs> yeah, so he designed actually the Commodore one twenty eight. But check this out. So it had this big board in it, right? And mm -hmm. there was some kind of signal integrity problem after assembly, like it was glitchy. And so for somehow he figured it out that if he ran this jumper wire that was about seven, eight inches long from this location to this, so he ran this big old honking wire, they built five million of those. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Can you imagine in production what that would cost today? Like, that first of all, no one in their right mind would do it. But mm -hmm. you yeah. guys would It'll never do that, right? Monthly. You'd kill yourself. Oh, it'll probably take a month or two to fix. Right? It, <laughs> it's just insane. So, anyways, I'll share that too. It's a funny story. But, oh, you know, postcards. Yeah, it's from definitely different it's definitely world. those types of things. Those types yeah. of things really make you uh, look at making sure that you're actually doing the right stuff in the beginning. Yeah, if you have to do like a little whatever, rework or cut a trace or do that, well, it's no big deal when you're doing 10. But when you're doing 10,000, nope. yeah, it hurts. And it gets yeah. expensive. Even if it's a fraction of a penny per board, once you go into mass production, it hurts. Oh, yeah. Um, it does. It can price you right out of the market. So, um, well... I'm excited to know that 
um, some folks from your team are coming out to be with us at Altium Live. I actually was right before I, I called in, I just found out that um, that's confirmed. And so um, for our listeners, if any of you are planning on coming to Altium Live October 9th through 11th, you can come meet this amazing team at, at Altium Live. So thanks, you guys, for, for being part of that. And thanks so much for filling us in. Um, Is there anything I might have not asked you or any more takeaways for our listeners before we before we sign off? I don't have anything, Sebastian. Do you have anything? No, I think we covered a good chunk of it. Okay, I have a last question. I just thought of it. You both are young Mm -hmm. and everybody says, you know, there's no young people in the industry. We can't attract. Well, in my (laughs) world, you guys are really young. So how the heck did you get here? How did we find you and how do we get more? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, um, so my experience uh, before, prior to doing this, I used to do a quick turn cable assembly and it was uh, it was electronics. Uh-huh. Um, and I had gotten my degree and I can't remember exactly how it happened, but someone <clears throat> had mentioned advanced assembly, one of my friends. Mm-hmm. Um, they were hiring and I was just like, okay, well, I'll just get my foot in the door, start as receiving shipping and then I'll kind of move in from there. Um, so, I mean, it's, I would just say word of mouth is definitely the best way to go and just talk about all the different cool stuff. You start talking about, uh, like, reflow and pick-and-place machines and all of the crazy technology that's involved in this, and you will you will definitely capture some minds that are interested. Well, okay, um, I, and, okay, I love what you're saying. And, like, you're in a process engineer, Sebastian, so... What would you say, like young people, when they think manufacturing, like I have kids in their early 20s, when they think of manufacturing, they think of like, I don't know, the Industrial Revolution, like a big dirty (laughs) factory, (laughs) you know, sweatshops, like, is that what your place looks like? Oh, no. Uh, We've actually taken the past couple of years to really spruce up our shop and get us to more like a world-class facility. It's very clean. It's very friendly. Um, We focus on the people here. So we have like all kinds of barbecues and fun things. Um, we'll do like, we'll go out to arcades and uh, do casino nights and those kinds of things. So it's definitely not just like, you know, I, I don't want to say just like sitting down and soldering something for, <laughs> you know, 12 hours Buy a day. It's definitely for not 12 that. hours with no air conditioning. <laughs> yeah. No, exactly. but I, I think that a lot of young people don't realize that there are career opportunities mm-hmm. and that, you know, a pick and place machine cost a ton of money is highly mm-hmm. automatic uh, automated it's so screaming fast these days it's it's hard to get your head around um so it's exciting to be part of the tech industry but i just all right how about you chow how'd we get you well, well for me when i went to school i actually went for it and then my counselor in school is like well chow i need you on my program because I don't have very many females in there. So when I, and so I was like, okay, I'll just go into your program. I actually ro- enrolled into his program and there was only two females in the whole entire class when we graduated. Wow. And so um, I actually was in customer service before getting a job at Advanced Assembly. Okay. And even after I graduated, I just halted, didn't do anything until I saw a job posting. I was like, okay, it's time to make the change in my career doing what I actually learned in school. And so that's how I saw the posting. I came in interview and started, got the job as the coding engineer. So back in 2009, so a long time ago. That's exciting. (laughs) Well, I think we need to tell these stories and encourage because one of my jobs here is to work with students and I love it. And I'm trying to get the word out, uh, you know, that it's not Mm -hmm. boring and it's exciting and it's, you know, I always tell everyone, um, like, I've been on the best field trips in the whole wide world, you know, because I came from a sales place. So going to see and, you know, selling for an assembly shop, you know, you go see what people are doing is amazing. When you mm-hmm. look at how tiny, like the size of rice, you know, some of these. <laughs> sand. Little, they're sand. They're so they're tiny. Sand now. Yes. And then how, how do we make a nozzle that can dispense <laughs> just the right amount of solder paste to exactly. lay down a piece of sand. You know, yeah. it's it's crazy. So anyways, we love our careers. I'm glad you guys 
I'm, it, I'm glad to see some kind of young, shiny faces. So thank you again both for your time. We've enjoyed learning about you and the great work you're doing at Advanced Assembly. I hope one or both of you get a chance to come out. They'll let you out to come play at Ultium <laughs> Life for a couple now, days. Now we're going to request both of us to go. There you go. Oh, you will <laughs> love will it. Oh, by the way. <laughs> We're really fun too because at All Team Live we pull out battle robots. We do a build oh a build gosh. and battle of robots. Yeah. That's exciting. With an open bar. That's awesome. Just yep. saying. Oh, even better. Yeah, it's really, <laughs> really fun. It's not like a drunk fest. That sounded terrible, but I'm just saying, you know, it's after hours and a bunch of nerders putting robots together and just pounding each other. It's really, really fun. So killer Sounds robots exciting. and alcohol, you got me there. <laughs> right? <laughs> Well, thanks again, you guys. It's been great talking with you. We appreciate you joining today. And to our listeners, thanks for joining us again. Remember to, to like, subscribe, and let us know what you want to learn about. We're always excited to bring you more information that you want to learn to be better at what you're passionate about. Thanks for joining. Until next time, remember to always stay on track. 